Packers 2022. Let's keep it in the KUAM News Link Zoom Room where we have the uh, president of the Society of Human Resource Managers, uh, Guam Chapter Attorney Mike Pangolin, uh, joining us now. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Chris. How are you doing this morning? Good morning, Jason. Good morning, Mike. Good. How are you? Uh, well, we're, we're doing all right. We're doing okay. We were just uh, trying to make sense of the latest uh, guidance flowchart. I don't know if you had seen this uh, latest flowchart to come out of. Um, this is out of public health, uh, but I guess we can kind of start. Um, and I know you got some stuff to talk about, Mike. But uh, is there any? Or just I guess your read on um, it, you know all these different guidances where that require people who aren't necessarily positive for the virus to uh, take time off from uh, work, right? So, uh, you know, as, as recently as like last week, if you're a close contact of a, uh, a known positive for COVID-19, then you would have to, you know, basically stay home from work for five days. Um, it used to be longer, but I was talking to some people who work in the private sector and they were basically saying like, oh, they finished out their sick leave like the second time they got, uh, you know, uh, had to isolate or, or quarantine. So is, is that on the, uh, is that weight on the employee when these types of instances uh, come up? Yeah, so if you, as an employee, if you have, um, if you're sick, if you have, you have some kind of a medical issue and that could include obviously COVID, you know, you have employers that offer sick leave um, will, will allow employees to take their sick their leave time. Um, but if they don't offer sick leave, there is a requirement that there's something called the um, Family Medical Leave Act, where if you have a medical issue, you're entitled to unpaid leave, a certain amount of unpaid leave per year. And so that's something that every employee, most employees are entitled to. I mean, it does apply to businesses. You have to have at least 20 employees or more, but uh, most businesses, um, you know, have to follow that, you know, so you would be entitled to unpaid leave if you've exhausted all of your sick leave. How much does the, how much leave does the FMLA allow? Yeah, so you get 12 weeks per year. Um, so you have to have worked for the company for a while. You can't, you can't be a brand new employee, but if you work for the company for, um, you know, 12 months at least, then uh, you're entitled to 12 weeks of unpaid leave annually. Unpaid leave, so that basically means you're going to be out for a long time. You're not going to get paid for it, but you're also not going to get fired. That's right. Yeah, and like I said, most companies though do offer sick leave, right? So you, you can you definitely got some time. Most of the most of the time, you're going to have some availability of paid leave. Um, but even if you don't, you know, at least your job is going to be secured for an extended period. And it doesn't have to be all at once. I mean, you can take it gradually. So if you need, you know, a little bit of the unpaid leave, you need a week, but you don't need, you know, more than that. You can, you know, you see it, it it saves up so that you get the full twelve annually. Is that what you're hearing from a lot of the human resources manager with SHRM that their uh, employees are are using the FMLA? Yeah, they, there there are um, employees that are um, using the FMLA uh, for you know COVID related uh, illness, um, but you know most of the I haven't heard any 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 serious issues arising um, with that mm -hmm. that causing really any, any problems. I think the problems that employers are having more and more now is that they're just losing their workforce because people have to either quarantine or they or they're out sick most of the time it's not just that they have to quarantine but that they actually have either they tested positive or they have symptoms and even if they test you know they have symptoms but they can't get a test right away they still have to be careful right and so employers the most important thing for employers is to protect the safety of their workplace mm -hmm. so even if they're not required to keep people out of the work workplace it's still in their interest as their employer you know they have a, they have an obligation to everyone to help their, their customers and to their employees so they you know it's the best practice is to have the employees stay home but that's a problem you know especially for the larger employees like the hotels that if you have a lot of people that are out you know for legitimate reason they're out because they they're being careful you know that does uh, kind of make it hard kind of to operate all your venues and so uh, what about this uh, COVID law update uh, briefing? Can we kind of go into what will be discussed? Yeah, so we have the SHARM group, the Society, Society for Human Resource Management is, you know, it's an HR um, organization that's just, you know, supports the HR profession, right? So 
we actually have monthly briefings. Yeah. And so um, each month, not every month, but, you know, there's a there month or two um, where we have different events, so we don't always hold this, but we call it a breakfast briefing. And it's about a 90 minute session in, uh, in the morning, most of the time once a month and on different topics. And so this is gonna be the first of our breakfast briefings for 2022. We didn't have one in January, but we usually start that off in February. And so we thought that, you know, the main topic on people's minds is COVID. And just because there's so many changes all the time, mm-hmm. you know, there's federal mandates and then there's local mandates and then the local mandates change. And they've evolved so much over the last couple of years that I think it's just in people's minds, everyone's sort of used to um, the routine of complying with certain things, right? Everyone always gets their temperature and they walk into a place and they all sign the log sheet. But they, we don't really necessarily think about, okay, what does the law actually require? And what is the current, what does the current law require? Because it may be different from what it was required last month. And so what it, we wanted to do was just give an update and just kind of talk about what is, what's actually the current state of the law and what's required now. And then what is required locally what, if anything, is required on the federal side, and then just um, sort of how can employers make sure that they're in compliance. And that's, you know, so that's, we thought that would be the nice nice way to start 2022 with that topic. But the topics change throughout the uh, throughout the year, and so we'll, we'll have a monthly briefing in March and April also. So what's the current uh, requirement uh, for the, I guess, the private sector? Do they all have to be fully vaccinated? In order to work, I'm just yeah, so kind of lost here. Interesting, it's, it, there is no the, the vaccination requirements applies to what's called covered establishments, and so those right. are going to be establishments that are mainly, mainly restaurants, bars, theaters, um, environments where mask wearing is has to be compromised to some degree, because you have to take the mask off when you eat and drink. Or at sporting events, you know the athletes have can't wear the mask during certain types of sports, and um, and so in in the, and there's a, you know it's a fairly long list of covered establishments, but it's mostly restaurants, bars, theaters, sporting events, and gym gyms, dance studios, yeah. right? That's another big one. But those are the the um, businesses where vaccination of employees is required and customers entering the establishment is required but there's a lot of except there's exceptions to that right so it's not really you call it a vaccine mandate but it's really an alternate it's either vaccine vaccination or weekly covid test right mm-hmm. so that's for, for the employees right so employees of these establishments don't absolutely have to be vaccinated they can opt to be tested um, once a week mm-hmm. what about right. those who have an exemption because we saw the guidance uh from uh, or circular from the Department of Administration, that initially, right, the exemptions uh, requests would go through public health, but then it was changed to government agency heads uh, were double employees. You know, it's, I find that to be a little bit, um, I think it creates a little bit of a problem, the fact that that's always part of the guidance because there's the testing option, right? So the exemption is, because exemption is, exists under the law, you know, that all, agencies, federal and local, have to abide by the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, and Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. And and so the ADA requires that you don't discriminate against someone in the workplace or anywhere because of a disability. And so that allows for a disability exemption, right? So if you have, for some reason, you have a medical condition where you can't be vaccinated, then you're entitled to um, be accommodated, or at least the business has to try to accommodate you. Same with Civil Rights Act, that's the religious exemption, where where you have, if you have a sincerely held religious belief and, you, and that prevents you from being vaccinated, you're entitled to be accommodated if the business can accommodate you. But the way that the covered establishment vaccination requirement works is that if you don't want to be vaccinated, for whatever reason, you can get tested and that they're required to allow you to be tested weekly. So, so you can present your exemption request if you have a medical condition or religious belief. But the way the, the government's regulations work is that the business, you know, you can consider those exemptions and determine whether you can accommodate the person. But the law allows you to just opt for this, the weekly testing. So it kind of simplifies it 
so that they, it makes the exemption request kind of less relevant on the local side. Yeah. Um, because it's uh, it, and I say that because we're you know I know we're going to talk a little bit about the federal mandates, but the local mandates has that option. So it's um, it's not as significant because you can just businesses don't necessarily have to worry too much about that because they can just say well okay then just submit a negative COVID test we won't you don't have to get vaccinated you know and that's um but you know i think you know so for the purposes of the regulation i don't think it's that significant um of an issue on the exemptions but if businesses want to impose a stricter vaccination requirement like businesses the regulation is just is just the legal requirement businesses have to impose that if they're a covered establishment but businesses can impose a much more stringent vaccination requirement if they want that's all you know it's up to them yeah. so if, let's say you didn't want to allow the testing option you're a business that wants to impose a vaccine mandate and you don't want to have any option about testing you just want to make it a mandate mm -hmm. okay then the exemption requests become a little bit more significant because you do have to honor those <clears throat> where you have to entertain them and determine whether you can reasonably accommodate uh, someone holding a uh, claiming a medical disability or sincerely held religious belief mm -hmm. and that's you know that kind of gets in i don't know if you want to go too far into this yeah. but the, the way to accommodate it you know just depends on the circumstances depends on the nature of your business and whether you can still safely operate and accommodate that individual but you got you have to go case by case and it, you have to look at each individual situation because each employee situation may be different yeah yeah we heard but, that there's a, a backup with, with the exemptions that uh, the AG's office, and I, I kind of wonder if they were just like, oh, I just threw up their hands and um, threw it back down to the the supervisor uh, level. But Mike, is that a, is that the accommodation then? Is the negative uh, weekly testing? Well, it's not not really an accommodation. Um, it's just I think that that was built into the regulation because they knew there was going to be they probably knew there was going to be a lot of requests for exemptions. And this is one way of kind of avoiding the accommodation issue. You don't really need to get into the accommodation issue because you can just, in other words, if someone asks for um, an accommodation, they make a request for a medical or a religious exemption, you could just say, okay, we understand you don't want to be vaccinated and just go ahead and accept it and say, okay, we, so we'll consider you to be in the group that's not being vaccinated. You'll be in the testing group. Right, you know, but so that's what it makes it, it makes the analysis a lot simpler. Mm -hmm. But what about these uh, private companies that can't afford to get you know test kits? And we've got the shortage of test kits. We've seen uh, public health um, say that the only people that should be going to you know, Gov Guam going to get tests tested are people who are symptomatic or Gov Guam uh, workers who require the negative weekly test. But I didn't see anything in there about the private sector. Right. But I'm just saying, like, if there are private sector, if there are businesses that are that um, there are employees who are exempt or want to be exempted, they still have to submit right to the weekly COVID testing. But where do they go to get tested, especially if they don't have any symptoms? Yeah, so it, it is a that is a problem <laughs> with the shortage of testing, yeah. Yeah. and um, and so you know there's you know it's hard if you have to get a weekly test it's going to be difficult if, especially if you're you're trying to get a free test. I know the right. clinics you can always get a test fairly quickly if you're willing to pay for it, right? But if you want a free test, then you're going to have to spend all day in line or make an appointment and maybe three days. And also, I know that the guidelines have changed, so they're not necessarily testing you yeah. um, unless you're. Um, you have symptoms, right? But with the government, government um, employees, you know, they've got a little bit of a different, they're treated a little bit differently because they've got that um, requirement, you know, and they have the requirement that, you know, that they, that, you know, the federal, I mean, sorry, the uh, Gulf Guam executive branch employees are required to be vaccinated or tested. So there's a separate requirement on them. That's not the covered establishment requirement. That's just the executive order for Gulf Guam employees. And because of that, they've sort of set up a process. So all government employees are supposed to be vaccinated, right? But or tested weekly. So they have a process set up where they can go. You know, they have age, some of the agencies, like the larger agencies, um, I believe, have the testing uh, in, on premises. I mean, they have they can they have a group of employees that are trained to administer the tests. That and the testing can be done because they have a higher volume, and because they're all subject to that requirement you know and so you know but for i know it's, it's difficult for private employers 
you know, if they're going to um, comply with that, the covered establishments that are subject to that, that for employees that have to be tested weekly, um, there has to be arrangements. You know, it's up to the employer. Employers don't have to pay for it, but they could, you know, they could set up something. Some employers actually um, that I, that I uh, represent have gone, have subjected some of their employees to training and their employees get an hour or two of training. I think it's from public health. Um, and the employees then are able to administer the test. So then they can get the test. These large employers can get the tests and actually give the test to their employees in-house, which saves a lot of time. They still have to submit the test, the swabs to, to swabs to the laboratory, just like everyone else. So they're gonna have to submit it and get the results the same way the rest of the results are made. But at least they can administer the tests more efficiently and um, with more availability. Mm -hmm. That's something that larger employers may want to look into. Mm -hmm. But they have to pay for the tests. No, the tests. The companies have I to pay the, for the yeah, tests. Yeah, the tests are the co under the covered establishments. Yeah, so the large establishments, if you can set that up, and that's something that I think is um, would really help the larger companies, is that you, uh, you know, it's a little bit of an investment because you have to you know, you pay your employees to get training. I mean, you pay while they're getting the training, right? So that, but once they got the training, you know, it makes it a lot easier um, on the on these employers as far as the testing. But aside from that, I mean, I know that it's it's hard to because of the testing um, availability, this lack of availability of the tests, it does make it difficult. But you know, for the most part, most employers that are subject to this mandatory vaccination or testing requirement, most of the employees are willing to do it. You know, and that's not, um, I haven't heard too much uh, in terms of tr problems with that issue because of the mandatory uh, testing requirement. Mike, uh, have there been any, because I remember when this, these mandates came out, it was like heard so much, so much from people that they were going to sue, that their rights, uh, yada, 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 uh, not to, you know, demean that. Uh, but have there been any successful challenges to any of these mandates? Uh, I mean, other than the Supreme Court one, uh, locally, have you heard about anything? Yeah, so there's not not been any locally. I, I don't know of any actual challenges locally. And I think it's um, it's a little bit different. I think locally because you know maybe it's a little easier to challenge on the federal side mm. because you're um, there's that sort of con principle, the constitutional principle, where the local governments are supposed to be the ones regulating things like safety and the you know, in the in the work not in the workplace but just safety generally and so sometimes you know they defer to the local legislature and the local um, governor for those things so it's less um, probably less uh, a, a ability to challenge you know on the local side but on the federal side yeah I mean as we've seen in the last month or so lots of success on that and you know I was on your show in November talking about how innovative this OSHA ETS standard was and how it's <laughs> unlikely it's going to be overturned and right, you know I don't yeah, yeah. the thing is I don't know whether that means I have egg on my face maybe <laughs> it's just maybe it's just scrambled egg though because yeah. if you look at the decisions I mean the decisions are split decisions right these Supreme Court decisions that have come out and they have um, it's true that they have blocked them blocked these um, executive orders on, on the presidential orders and the OSHA um, agency order that imposed a, man, a mandatory vaccination and testing very similar to the Guam covered establishment mandate. But, um, you know, you just have to consider that, you know, the Supreme Court, you know, it's made up of human beings, right? So they have different views, but I, you know, it's a split decision. It was six to three on that. Wow. And uh, there are three justices that agreed with me. With <laughs> so, the, the three justices that also have scrambled egg on their face. I guess, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Mike, it just seems so easy to argue that, I mean, you know how it, it seems, right, iffy, where you have someone could say, oh, well, I take the vaccine and it says it's going to do this, but then I could still end up in the hospital or even even with the weekly testing. You know, I mean, we know about COVID-19 testing and just because you have that test on that one day of the week, nothing is preventing you from getting COVID like the next day or any other day in between your weekly testing. So, I mean, on its surface, when you look at it and you kind of had a cursory understanding of how testing works and whatnot, it just kind of seems like it's all being held together very flimsily. Yeah, I, I, I agree, you know, it's, uh, but, but they're doing the best they can, I guess. You know, they have to have some kind of, they have to take some sort of action to, to try 
to um, prevent the spread and try to reduce the number of cases. And this, you know, and it, it's evolving, and that's why the, you know, these guidance memos they come out pretty often and they change so much. But it's, um, you know, that you just wait and see for the next one because there's a whole different sort of theory of what's the best way to protect people. And now they're, you know, now they're saying that, you know, just because you're exposed doesn't mean you necessarily have to get tested because you don't have symptoms. You know, and the strains all change in terms of with their severity and their transmissibility, and it's um, so. I think that you know, this that you get the sense that we're sort of figuring it out as we go. But I guess that's the way it is, you know. And and uh, I agree that it's not that doesn't really make sense. Some of the guidance because the days seem arbitrary. You know, you count five days from the date of your test result or from the date you first had symptoms. You know, and, and then there's exceptions if you are unvaccinated. And there's another protocol if you've had it before. So I mean, it's it's a lot to understand, but I think that you know the um, all you can do is the best you can, right? And, and that's what I think everyone is doing. You know, that's that's all we can ask. Yeah. This kind of sums it up for me. This is the latest public health guidance. Uh, I think it's like the third in the last couple of weeks. But it says right there in red, capital letters, subject to change without notice, with about <laughs> ten asterisks. And so that's where we're at now. Right. Uh, Mike, so you're doing this whole COVID law uh, seminar. How do people kind of sign up for it? Uh, where do they go? Yeah, so we've had so far a pretty good uh, turnout. Um, you know, uh, a lot of people are interested, I think, in, in, in this topic. But it's uh, So you just can go to our SHRM website at guam.sherm.org, and that uh, will have a link to um, registration for the event. It's on February 2nd. That's on Wednesday at 8.30 a.m. It's going to be virtual. And so once you sign up, uh, you'll get a link that will uh, you can click on to bring you into the event. And uh, so we'll talk about kind of what we're talking about now in terms of, you know, what's required. Mainly the focus is going to be what's required, you know, not so much on, if, you know, too much of a discussion on, you know, recommendations for different um, issues for safety necessarily, unless it's required, because that's, kind of my area is just to tell you what the law allows, what the law doesn't allow and what the law, um, you know, prohibits, right? So we'll, um, we'll deal with that. You know, we'll talk a little bit about what's happened on the federal side. Uh, largely, I don't know, doesn't affect anyone anymore now that it, most of them have been blocked, but there are some that still, that still have an impact on uh, the local businesses. And then, you know, we'll just talk through sort of the issues on what do you need to do if um, your employee gets COVID or if they have symptoms that last, you know, a lot of that's happening a lot more and more now is people that have COVID and they recover, but they don't fully recover. So how yeah, do you yeah. handle so, that? Yeah, Mike, and, the, and when you're, we're talking about this uh, latest flow chart, so the guidance here is if you're fully vaccinated or ineligible for vaccination, um, then you're a close contact of a positive, you don't feel sick, you, you, you can go to work and school there's no quarantine or testing required for school or work right so i mean as an employer i'm looking at this rapidly evolving um subject to change without guidance and i would be concerned because it seems like just a couple weeks ago the guidance was totally different right and, and i think you would have to get tested if you were a close contact of a known covid 19 positive so i mean i know it's the government's guidance and it changes but as an employer if i was an employer i would kind of be scratching my head saying wait a second a couple weeks ago this person who uh, could be asymptomatic, could be a spreader of the virus at the workplace now that they're not required to test or quarantine if they're a close contact of a COVID-19 positive. Yeah, you know, that, that's, that's right. And I think that what employers are, have been doing is just exercising their best judgment and not necessarily, you, know, you look to the guidance yeah. for guidance, you know, and, it, and you look to the guidance to kind of explain to you what's going to get you into trouble if you don't follow certain things and you might get into trouble because they sort of explain to you what the government is expecting of you as a baseline, as a minimum. But yeah, I mean, that's, you can't really rely on that to deter, to dictate your decision making when it comes to workplace safety. You have to do what you feel is right on the, on the safety side. And if, you know, if there's not enough tests and so now they can't really require that you get tested because there's no way to get tested it's okay, not so funny like, Bree. sorry it is funny though what else can you do but yeah. laugh i mean and i mike i know some small business owners who will look at this latest guidance and be like thank god i was almost gonna have to close this week yeah yeah no i mean it's it's um you know but i think businesses have all have been 
using their best judgment. Yeah, you because know, mm-hmm. sometimes you don't, you, the guidance comes out, but not all businesses are aware of it. Not everyone's able to kind of like get on the internet and look through everything and, and shift and navigate through everything. And so what they do is they just kind of wing it. But what they're doing is trying to decide, okay, what's the safest way? Of, you know, and sometimes it's individual, it's case by case, you know, and, and, uh, and businesses are all different. But, um, but you know, you, you try, you do the best you can, but you try it, but you have to do it fairly. That's one important, really important thing is even if your rule that you're establishing is not necessarily linked to a guidance mm-hmm. or a government regulation, whatever that rule is, apply it fairly. Don't favor certain employees and give them, you know, you treat them a little better than others. If you have a rule and you're saying, okay, if you're exposed and you report that you're, you've been exposed, you know, take X number of days off, take the week off, rem- work remotely. That's always a, a good option mm-hmm. because just because the person can't come in doesn't mean they can't work, mm-hmm. right? So you can work remotely, those kinds of things, but whatever you're going to do, do it fairly, you know, because you don't want employees to sort of feel like they're being discriminated against or just to feel like your workplace is not a fair place. So how many times have you had to change your presentation in the <laughs> past week? Oh, I'll tell you, you know, I've, I've pretty much gutted the federal mandate. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because I, I wake up in the morning and I see my oh notifications on my phone. Okay, mandate blocked, mandate yeah. blocked. Okay, well, <laughs> scratch that, scratch that, scratch that. It's going to be a cool. short talk, guys. <laughs> so it's mostly going to be the local side. You know, but there's plenty There's plenty to talk about on the local side. That could change three times before your presentation, though. Without so. notice. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. All right. Well. <laughs> Thanks. Well, thank you, Mike. Yeah, good talk. You're welcome. Right. Good to see both of you. Yeah, be yeah. safe, my friend. Stay healthy. Okay. Right on. Be safer, okay. actually, is what I'm going with. Be safe, not really. We need to up it a little bit. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Uh, good talk there. Yeah, I mean, even the human resources people are kind of like, eh, huh? <laughs> uh, hi, Jay. Yeah, uh, well, we've, we've, you know, covered uh, not only on this show, but also on Nestor Furs show in full Zoom has covered, you know, uh, the HR industry over yeah. the last two years. And even they admit.